it's good, it's good to have you. And uh, we have some good information to, uh, to pass on tonight. So first of all, um, like I say, welcome to, to tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, some of the staff here. I'm Claude Valcourt, the Director of Public Works for the town. Uh, behind there uh, is uh, Debbie. She's the Communications Assistant. Over there is Felicity. She's the communi Communication Coordinator, Corporate Communication Coordinator. And back there is Laura, our IT, no, not IT, excuse me. Um, venue Technician. Venue Technician, thank you very much. And over here is Lorenzo uh, with GFL. And Lorenzo will have the floor in a second. Um, in case you don't know, washrooms are right across over there, male, female. If you need to, uh, it is a, heaven uh, forbid, it is an emergency. There are some exits through these doors here, down there where you came from, of course, and the must have one is in the back on the southeast corner of, of the parking lot. So if you don't know, you just follow me, I'll be leading you out. I don't expect anything wrong, but you never know. It's, it's part of the, uh, Protocol. Pardon me? Well, I said you'd be the first one out, and then she said, no, you should be the last one out. Oh, <laughs> oh well, we'll do, we'll do a sweep at the end, so I might have to come back in. <laughs> uh, there were some coffee snacks. I'm not sure how much was left, so it's good. I didn't expect that many people, so I didn't bring a whole lot, but um, there's some left. Um, so the purpose of the session tonight really is to, we have a lot of information to share with you, and that's the purpose of it. We want to share as much as we can. We want to take some feedback from you, some questions. Uh, Lorenzo's got a presentation to, to go through. Some, there's some questions at the end that they're, they're fre frequently asked questions. So we'll go through those. If we don't cover the questions that you have in your mind, feel free at the end, there'll be a mic that's gonna go around that we can, um, uh, that we can hand to you and then you can speak in the microphone because it is recorded. And having said that, if, uh, if you ask a question, and if you're not comfortable with being recorded, then we need to know after, and we can ask questions afterwards. Am I right? And we can do it on the side, if you have a problem with being recorded. So other than that, the video is going to be, the, the, the session is going to be recorded. It's going to be posted on the website. So uh, you'll be famous. <laughs> Maybe. Any questions so far? Any concerns? Any concerns with anything? OK. So without further ado, um, I will, uh, I'll go through the agenda first, first of all. We have a, a presentation, and then uh, Lorenzo brought some, some hands-on, so you can feel, touch, look at, um, basically to, to clarify some of the questions that we've received, uh, which is good that we do this a little bit after the kickoff, or after the, the process has started, so that you do have questions for us, right? So uh, we'll be looking at that, and Lorenzo's gonna speak on those, and clarify some of the plastics that, you know, which ones one and two, what's good, what's not good, all the good stuff. So we'll cover that. So if we can ask, though, that all the questions come at the end, and uh, we'll make sure you answer all your questions. Okay, so if there's no other questions, I will pass the mic over to Lorenzo. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claude. Pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming out. It's great to have a chance to speak to you about recycling. I know there are a lot of changes recently. I know people have a long list of things to do in a day, and uh, you know, getting to the bottom of a long list of, of tasks and items and, and chores. And so paying mind to what should and shouldn't go into recycling is yet one more thing. So I really appreciate your, your attention, your care for this subject. Um, I'm going to talk pretty broadly about uh, a lot about sort of globally what's happening in the recycling business. This is a, an industry now that entirely depends on international relations. It, it's truly a, a commodity-based global enterprise. Um, there is no one country that has all the pieces necessary from A to Z to fully solve or provide a full start-to-finish recycling program. It's all based on international relationships. So, sorry, a little quick there. I'll start by talking to you about some of the changes that have occurred in China recently. What that's meant for the globe, what that's done to recycling, and the consequences of it. And then I'll go into how this boils down to the town of Morinville and the sort of need to know for the program that we provide. Uh, and then finally, I'll touch on a little bit what might uh, change in the future. So we, we go from doom and gloom to hopefully a little bit sunnier by the end. <laughs> okay, so. 
China historically has attracted a lot of material from North America. North American recycling programs in, in the 70s really um, came on strong. A lot of material was generated. China became increasingly a manufacturing hub with a voracious appetite for raw materials. So China needed to somehow uh, attract more raw materials in order to continue uh, making manufactured goods cheaply. In the North American market at that time, there was a lot of infrastructure for recycling, actually. This is where it had a lot of its infancy, infancy so it was growing here quite well. One of the ways China devised to attract more material from North America was to offer that it didn't really need to be sorted. That they would handle the sorting with the access to much cheaper labor over in China. This took the burden off of local uh, recycling providers to have to expend a lot of time, effort, equipment, and, and labor in exhaustively sorting the materials. They could more do a kind of a bulk sort. All papers together, all plastics together, all steel cans together, and then ship it en masse by sea cans over to China, where the further sorting um, would be performed. Of course, as China exported more and more materials to North America, finished goods, I should say, in North America, there was plentiful empty sea cans that had to cross the ocean back to China, which meant very cheap shipping rates. So not only could they take all, did they offer to take the material with less sorted, um, but they also could do it with very low transport costs. So this is how China came into this enterprise of being the world's depository for, for most of the world's scrap materials. 40% of the entire globe's recyclables end up in China. So, 40%. Um, so, this had a, a number of, of consequences, and they first started seeing this in about 2007, 2011, when they softly, quietly introduced legislation that started banning certain materials, but it was never enforced. It's actually as early as 2007, China entirely banned plastics uh, 3, 6, and 7. Totally banned. They just never enforced it. We continue to collect those plastics in curbside programs and just sort, sort all the containers out, be it a one, a two, a six, or a seven, mix it together and send it to China for further sorting. But something was amiss, obviously, because, because they were passing legislation. So in addition to that now, they've come on much more stringently. They've started to enforce extremely strictly, very punitively, and they've also banned any unsorted plastics, period. So even if it's a high-value desirable plastic, like a one and a two mixed together, banned, has to be sorted now into its individual grades. This is back what we used to do back in the 70s. This was what they offered that we no longer had to do and no longer need to bear the cost of that. So this is now a reversal of those times. Um, the other problem that came to light is that what was actually happening, see the offering was, send us all your mixed materials, we'll sort it, exhaustively into its individual grades and subgrades, and then we'll recycle it. But the reality was very different of what was actually happening. So environmental consequences. Um, China most recently filed with the World Trade Organization under protection of the environment, animal, plant life, and health, uh, health and protection of human health and safety. And it was by these World Trade Organization assertions that they were able to start all the banning of these products, right? Um, because there is international law into how you can uh, stop the import and export of certain commodities and whether that's a fair trade practice and et cetera, et cetera. But they did it under the premise of protection to health and safety in the environment. So why? Well, within China, there's one province, Wenan. Um, it's the, China is the beating heart of the world's plastic reuse machine machinery. And within China, the key place is Wenan province. Over 20,000 small businesses operate in Wenan, 20,000 plastic recycling businesses. So that would be something like an area the size of, of the capital region with 20,000 businesses doing nothing more than importing scrap plastic, sorting it, and then making little pellets that can then be used to make new plastic goods and you sell those pellets. Um, sorry, 60,000 small scale family owned workshops. So just a tremendous industry here, really grew up very quickly. This is plastic smog around Wenan County. These aren't cherry picked photos either. You go on Google Earth or you know, do a Google search. It's plentiful, numerous articles by numerous reporters 
um, showing this. This is plastics burning next to a river. So now we start to understand when they brought in all the mixed plastics, grade one to seven, what was happening to those low grade plastics. See, in North America, we never really found much value to them, but China said they had lower costs and they could find a good use for them. It's not really what they were doing. They were sorting out the valuable plastics and they were burning the low grade. You can imagine not a lot of well-engineered, constructed sanitary landfills in China, right? And if there were, that would come at some cost. So what's the cheapest way to get rid of an ever-growing pile of plastics outside the local workshop? You burn it. So here's some plastics polluting a river. This they call white pollution in China now, specifically plastic bags. Even in China, plastic films have a much lower value than other plastics. Um, someone started doing it, explains one local. He made money, so more people did it. The government saw it was a good source of tax revenue and encouraged the industry. It was random. There's no use of resp respirators, safety equipment, hard hats, steel-toed boots, nothing like this. Workers pour over boxes of shredded plastic, pour boxes of shredded plastic flakes into a table-sized funnel, melted plastic fumes rising into his face. This is an, an example of the type of, of business that is, is actually occurring. It's very well documented now in increasingly uh, respiratory disease in children, cancer rates rising. So what does all this mean? Well, here, here's the deal. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking through a little too quick. I apologize. Don't take too long, but I just need to... <laughs> <laughs> Got to hit the sweet spot. Okay. Not too All fast, right. not too slow. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what gives? Well, the, the truth is when you burn plastics, especially when you burn them just in the presence of oxygen and you do it just at regular temperatures that you might get from lighting a match, um, you, you generate a lot of dioxins and furans. Now, colloquially, cancer researchers will tell you dioxins and furans are known as the most carcinogenic chemicals that have ever been tested in a laboratory. They're also called a POP, persistent organic pollutant. That means they, they are digestible, they build up in tissues, in, in organisms, and they're persistent, they don't break down. So they get inside. They enter the digestive tract and they go across the digestive barrier into the bloodstream. And then they're stored in body fat. Yeah. So not digested in the sense that they are broken down. They're not bro broken down, they're persistent. But in the sense that they're absorbed. So they're absorbed. And they're persistent in the environment, so the levels always go up, go up, go up, and they take hundreds of years to break down. So they're the worst uh, you know, selection of characteristics for our, our carcinogenic substance. Okay, so that's what you get when you burn plastics. So not good. So this uh, meant that Chinese citizens have stormed government offices, refused work, consistently pressured the government regarding environmental matters, and it's becoming a major issue of legitimacy for the Chinese government. So um, the end result of that is they said, okay, we've done it for a few decades, we need to stop, and they came down <coughs> with a very hard stop. But now this has created a whole back up in the entire pipeline of recyclables. Because we just pushed it all over there, thinking that you know they were going to handle it. They weren't really handling it in a very sustainable way. Now they've shut that down hard. Meanwhile, none of our programs, none of our local infrastructure, businesses, we're not set up to go back to how we once used to do it back in the 70s. So this is where the real crux, this is where the rubber meets the road, this is where the real problems uh, come about. So, consequences to uh, Alberta, well, Canada and all Western nations, in fact the entire globe, produces far more plastics than are ever recycled or consumed by reusers. That's particularly true in Canada though. So now we have all this plastics, we used to send to China, they're not going to take it anymore, what do we do with it? Um, as I said, it's an interconnected business. It relies upon these relationships, and when 40% of the world's material goes one place and all of a sudden that place says no, no more, it takes some time to adapt. So the need to know. Some things to understand about plastics that might clarify some questions you have. 
For one thing, plastics are grouped into seven grades. However, amongst those seven grades, there's numerous subgrades with different additives to make it more elastic, um, to have it more resistant to UV uh, breakdown, to change the melting point, to make it, to color it, to its smoke point changes. So when you recycle plastic, you basically make flakes or pellets, and then you heat them just to the point that they're melted but not burning, and you re-extrude them into a, into a new product. So if you have different subgrades of a plastic, it could all be plastic, uh, say, number one, but it's a different subgrades, those don't mix well, because one might be smoking or one might still be hard while the other one is now melted. And so you get lumps and bubbles and issues in whatever product you're trying to make. So we have this idea that, well, a two is a two, for instance, with plastics, like a two in a, in a grocery bag is the same as a two that's made into a Tide bottle. No, they're not. So this is where some of why, so this is when people ask, well, why are you taking two as a rigid, but you won't take two as a flexible? That's one aspect to it. Um, so what we're intending to do is prune the program back down to more philosophically, I'll explain it as a demand pull. So we originally recycling was, you saw so much cardboard. This is what really kicked it off was cardboard in the 70s. Cardboard producers, cardboard's quite energy and water intensive to produce, and the fiber strands in cardboard are quite long and quite resilient. Like if you've ever thrown a piece of cardboard you've seen it in a puddle, it might sit in the puddle for 36 hours before it's truly waterlogged. Like it's pretty resi resilient material, so it has a high cost to produce it. So we saw all this cardboard in the trash, and we're like, well, that's very wasteful. It can easily go right back into the, the you know, chain of events to make cardboard. It can be just added right back in, and there's tremendous cost savings to doing that. So people started to separate cardboard out, and it had a value, and Weyerhaeuser in particular really pushed this strongly, and they paid that value, and it was good enough to pay for the diversion of it, and it was being pulled out of the stream. Sorry, I keep clicking that button. Being pulled out of that stream as a demand pull. There was a, a willing, waiting receiver saying, give me more of it, we can use it all day long. Let's get it, get it, get it. We've gone from that model slowly over time. We've creeped and we put more and more materials in for convenience because we thought they were gonna go to China and they were going to be handled well there. And we've gone to a supply push. Just throw it in the bag and make it someone else's issue to figure out what the heck to do with it. So the whole premise here is to go back to that demand pull. So what materials have a ready and waiting market, both internationally and domestic? That market has always existed without interruption, so it's a very reliable market. Those materials are like a demand pull, and that's what we're trying to get back to. And if you really look and you track the commodity values of plastics and how much material is being consumed and who generally, what products are generally made from recycled plastic, what you find is that one rigid ones and twos have always historically had a very strong market. There's a, a strong demand pull there. A, pretty much most all the other plastics, and this varies a little bit region by region, because you might have some local business, say using plastic film in the industry it's called, so basically plastic bags. And in that little geographic area, there might be a good uh, demand pull for plastic film, even though Generally, across all different marketplaces or provinces or cities, plastic film is usually very weak. and There's not a lot of people who have a demand for it. So what we're trying to do with the program is guarantee you that what's on our acceptable items list is always recycled. There's nothing on there that maybe we can recycle, we can recycle it one day, maybe we can't the next. And there's no materials on there where, where we're like, well, maybe one day we'll be able to recycle it. There's none of that now. We've gone back. We've pruned it right down to those materials we can guarantee. That means a lot of plastics have to come out. That's the reality. But by weight in the recycling blue bag, it's only about 10% by weight of the total material. With the bags, I can understand by volume it might look like more. They take up a lot of airspace. But the reality is by weight, it's only about 10%. So by including the 10%, we're kind of jeopardizing the successful recycling of the other 90%. Part of the reason for that is, in addition to banning a lot of these materials, they've also insisted on the materials that do enter that they are 99.5% pure. The standard used to be 96, 97%. You're allowed 3 or 4% contamination, 30 or 40 pounds in a 2,000 pound bale. Um, now, 
that's been over 60 or 80 pounds of a 2,000 pound bill. Now that's been cut right down to half of 1%. So the more materials you include, the greater range of materials, the harder it is to sort out the individual materials. So by including a lot of these plastics, we don't have any end market for them. And they make sorting all the other materials very difficult. So that's part of why we have really gotten very strict on the number of plastics that are, are included in the blue bag program. So some frequently asked questions. Do you know of any recycling collection centers that still collect number four, five, six plastics? There, there may very well be. I know of a few myself. It's not so much if they allow you to throw it in the bin. The point I'm trying to make with all this backstory about China is we need to really ask ourselves, okay, if it's only wish cycling, I wish this was recyclable, so I'm just going to throw it in and hope, that actually doesn't lead to very good places. What's the reality of recycling? So it's not really have they updated their program and do they allow more stuff to be thrown in the bin or the bag or whatever, what have you. The real question is what actually happens? And I will stand by everything that I've said in this presentation. You can find some exceptions. This industry is like, there are so many exceptions. And you might find a, a particular little plastic recycler somewhere, and so those local communities it's servicing can put in more material, and it really does get recycled into a new product. But by and large, across a large industry, I really stand by what I'm saying in this presentation. The real strong plastics have always been the rigid one and twos. Um, how to go about getting a new bin or new pins for the lid. This happens to come up. You can contact uh, GFL or the town, and the town will forward your concern to GFL. That's just one we've gotten recently whenever we talk to anyone about any topic. How do I get my bin repaired? Um, can we opt out of the program? No. Th the premise of these programs is they're provided town-wide, and that way it's very efficient and the cost is very low. So the programs provided, you know, for roughly five or six dollars a month. I mean, that's probably you should probably spend more on that in coffee in a month. They, they become very cost-effective programs. If you think about all the consumer goods you buy in a month, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and then to take away the majority of that material and have it recycled for five bucks, I think it's pretty pretty good. Certainly, if it was an opt-in, opt-out, the price could easily double, and that wouldn't be a for anything other than the real inefficiencies and the increased cost of transport. Can we bundle cardboard beside the recycle roll cart for pickup? This one doesn't really apply to Morinville, but some communities have blue carts instead of blue bags. And of course, the best thing there is to chop up the cardboard and actually put it in the blue cart, just as it happens. Your information suggests that glass bottles that have deposits are recyclable, whereas other glass bottles are not. You know, what's up with that? Well, there's the deposit system funds an entire movement of material throughout the stream. And so it makes something that's like a very hard to recycle material like glass, uh, like glass it makes it recycled um, because there's these extra funds moving the material. But it's at a cost, and that cost is, is represented with the deposit system. Other glass bottles don't have that deposit system, so when we collect them in the blue bag, we then have to try to market that material, and it's incredibly hard to market of post-consumer glass. The virgin material is very plentiful and very cheap. Now one nice thing though, however, is glass, if you look in grocery stores, glass is less than 1% of all the containers in grocery stores now. It's really, really gone down. I mean, the one I really noticed was Miracle Whip, because I like Miracle Whip, but uh, when they went away from glass containers and Miracle Whip, for instance, everyone's doing that. It's just less and less glass all the time. Where does the glass go if it cannot go in the recycling bin? Okay, so the hard reality with these plastics, with some of this glass that doesn't have a deposit, the hard reality is they're going to go to the landfill. Now, I think, though, that is not great, and we're hoping that improves with time. And when we have a realistic, reliable output that we can sign our names to, then we will re-include re those materials in the recycling program. But for now, we think we need to get back to basics. The other thing I will highlight, this might sound really odd from a you know, dyed-in-the-wool recycler, but there's a lot of worse things you can do with, with plastics than put them in a landfill, as we talked about earlier. You know? Uh, you know, a sanitary engineered landfill is not good. Recycling is far better. 
but it's the least of all evils when you compare that to, say, burning the plastics. Okay, there's a lot of worse things we can do, and it's not allowed here, and that's a good thing. Cardboard is not on the list of acceptable items. I'm not sure if that was ever really the case in Morinville, but it's actually one I've seen recently. Uh, absolutely cardboard is. It's actually one of the few materials that has a very strong, th thriving local Canadian market for, for material. So. Most grocery bags are number two plastic. The same grade as number two rigid plastic. But you're accepting one and not the other. It's because they're both a high-density polyethylene. Well, a lot of the bags actually aren't technically. They're stamped too, but they're actually a medium-density polyethylene, plus with a bunch of additives. Um, and they do actually recycle very differently. There's very few recyclers making any kind of a product that can have both a rigid plastic coming in and a flexible film, or like what plastic bags are, coming in and combine both and make a, a product out of it. There will be, for sure, some exception that makes me a liar, but there will be some exception, but overall, in terms of the entire, um, the entire industry, that is certainly not the case. Well, I'm doing all kinds of fancy things now, right? Okay? <laughs> Sorry. I got a twitchy finger, I keep hitting that button. Um, another point was that, well, we see some other programs, for instance, in British Columbia, accept plastic film. Yes, they do. And if you go to their websites and, and you really research it, they'll, it's public knowledge. That plastic that they collect, that, those low-grade plastics, they still accept them in the program, they bundle them all up, and they sell them to companies that still burn coal for energy, and they burn the plastic instead. Now, supposedly, those companies are tested, and they're burning at temperatures that limit the amount of dioxins and furans that are generated. But totally separate to their claims, uh, Europe uses a lot of, of waste incineration because it has very little uh, landfill space, and it's very well tested and well known now, now around all the land of those incinerators, which are supposed to burn at very high temperatures and prevent the formation, all the land around the incinerators, you can detect the dioxins and furans, and it's constantly rising. So if the Europeans haven't gotten it right, I wonder if British Columbia actually has. So, and there's pros and cons. Some people will say, well, that's better than the alternative, and I don't want to get into a debate about that. But the point is, we believe in recycling. Burning it for energy isn't recycling. And it has a lot of question marks next to it. So. Again, some people tell a nice story and, oh, we're doing so much better and why are you guys cutting out all these materials? Well, we're cutting them out because in our personal opinion as a company, we want to get back to what we can actually prove what is real and stay away from the ifs and maybes and buts. Um, what are you supposed to do with other types of plastic that are no longer being accepted? Again, right now, the hard reality is those should be put in the waste bin and they go to the landfill. And as the situation improves, as new industries start, and there's already some noises being made. There's one company, EFS Plastics, it's been operating on Ontario for more than a decade very successfully. They're one of the few ones that actually do take in plastic films and truly recycle them. They're talking about starting a new site in Alberta. Now they're talking, you know, a construction build date. It won't be open until, you know, late into 2020. We have to see if it actually gets constructed, if they go into business, if they stay in business. Um, but if those things come true, we'll add it back in. Like, we're, we want to recycle. What but was the name of that company, sir? EFS Plastics. So there's a lot of uh, interest because China's not taking it anymore. All of a sudden, we're drowning in surplus material. That material also drove down the, the prices, so it's very, very cheap. So now's a good time, if you're in the plastic business, to get involved. Maybe, right? Depending on what other factors come into play, but potentially it is. So there's starting to be some interest, and maybe we'll get some local infrastructure. And then as we do, and it's reliable and consistent, we'll add the materials back in. So future outlook, uh, I've touched on that. Um, there is some you know, reason for some you know, cautious optimism that I think the free market, private enterprise, is always good at solving problems, and we now have a glut of materials in Canada. So I think it stands to reason over a period of time, someone will learn a way to turn that to a, to a beneficial advantage, and we'll start more businesses. I mean, that, that's sort of the principle of it. It doesn't always work perfectly, but that's the principle of it. So I think there's reason for some optimism that it won't always be like this. Um, the other thing is, remember, although I've gone on a lot about all these plastics and you see a lot of these plastics in your home and it is frustrating because you want to do the right thing 
with them, and now you're putting them back in the garbage. Remember, that is only 10% of what goes into the blue bag by weight. So closing words, although there's been a lot of uh, negativity here, I still believe uh, in this quote, the practice of recycling pushes us in the right direction toward the development of the technologies of sustainable material use and toward the creation of less materialistic, more socially and environmentally engaged ways of living. There's no greater hope in any other, other direction. Indeed, in the long run, there's nowhere else to do. I still believe this is a marathon, not a sprint. I still believe in the long, long run, we get better at recycling all the time. There's a hiccup, it needs a course correction. North America has to get better again at handling its own materials rather than just you know, pushing them outside the borders. But I think we will adapt and get better and, and things will improve. And I'm uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. The manufacturers that can make the items? Yes. Bring them in for them. Well, it's true. There's legislation now that called extended producer responsibility when they want to make, if you create, if you manufacture the good, you have to be responsible for ensuring there is an end of life home for the good and to push the responsibility uh, for these things away from the consumers and back on the manufacturers. And there is a lot of talk of legislation there. There's successful EPR legislation in British Columbia, Ontario, Nova Scotia. You know, as I've alluded to, it's not always perfect, but it's a start. Europe has taken this model very strongly. But the other thing that, you know, you can look towards Europe, a lot of people in much smaller spaces than we have the benefit of here in Canada. Um, so Europe tends to lead the way in a lot of these things. Europe has now really pushed the EPR strategy. It's been very successful there. But now they've found that even it can't solve all the problems, and they've gone back to just banning materials. You've probably heard Europe will very soon straight up ban all single-use plastics, period. Just stop producing them. So uh, myself, having been in the industry a long time, I favor those approaches. I would also favor an approach where you say very strictly, you can produce this grade, this grade, and this grade for these types of goods, and that's it. Because it's like this ever-increasing, it sounds like not a lot when we say seven grades, but when you get into the subgrades, it's dozens, hundreds of different grades of plastic. It's very confusing, it's very hard to sort. It's very hard for anyone to have the infrastructure to get that very specific grade again, to make that very specific good that has needs certain properties. So I'm, I'm in favor of some legislation here to tell the manufacturers what they can and can't do. So those are all possibilities. So that concludes my presentation. I'm sorry if I you know, belabored some points or droned on a little too long, but thank you for your attention. And shall we take some questions now? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so if there are any questions, <laughs> can you use the mics? Switch it. Testing, testing. I checked the uh, I'm an Edmontonian. Just I'm an Edmontonian. I just moved here. I'm I used to be an Edmontonian, moved here in May. And I had thought they were restricting what goes into into for recycling. Well, I checked on the website today, and it kept saying they're going to take everything. And I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll just bring my stuff to Edmonton and that. But I shouldn't do that. So is Edmonton going to be more responsible like Morinville? <laughs> So I'm very uh, familiar with the Edmonton operation, even the gentleman responsible for operating it. He's a very good guy. Um, comes off Ontario. There are some plastics that he has uh, access to getting recycled uh, through contacts he has that are simply contacts not open to others. So he's been in the industry a very long time. So there's that aspect to it, that sometimes this business, there's a limited amount of material that they need. So who do they buy from? They buy from the ones they've known for a long time. So there's an aspect to that. But the other aspect to it that I can vouch for is really very true, is Edmonton has always taken the philosophy, just make it easy for the residents, throw everything in, 
And if it's not really recyclable, we'll just sort it out ourselves and landfill it off to the side um, and, uh, and make it easy for everyone that way. Well, the reality is with this 99.5% purity, that strategy is really under pressure. Because when you're allowing 100 different types of things in, and now you've got to sort each one out, that makes it a lot harder than if you only allowed 50 things in and you only had to sort 50 ways rather than 100 and get that 99.5% purity. So I would rather suspect in coming years we see some changes within Edmonton. Certainly. I, uh, I was curious about being, they, they're taking so little of our recycling now, are we still going to have to pay the big cost to have it moved? The short answer is yes. You know, like I live in a condo, and in, in that condo, in the last three weeks, they took two bags and a little bit of cardboard. The rest they left behind. Okay, well, I think there might be something else uh, occurring there. Um, so if we can find out what condo that is, then we can specifically uh, speak with residents, maybe have a, an open house just at that condo and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Because really, what you used to put in the bag, 90% of it can still go in. It's only 10% that, that we're really asking well, to be kept up. At our condo, the one time, they, I bet you there was 15 bags out there and they took two. The rest of them they left behind. With pink love notes. Huh? With pink love notes. Yes, with pink love notes on each one. Yeah. Okay. okay, so definitely there's um, uh, you know, some miscommunication happening that we should resolve. So if maybe after we can get the name of the condo complex, we can specifically do some better education. And then from our condo complex down the street, I drove down that street the next day, and there's a bag here with a pink tag, and a bag there with a pink tag, and a bag there with... They just aren't picking it up. So why should we be paying them the big bucks to pick up, pick up our recycling if they're not going to pick it up? I understand you. Um, I think the goal, though, of those pink tags is just for people to understand the one or two items they're putting in the bag that's wrong, take those out, and then put it out next week, and it will be taken. Yeah. The, the goal is not to not pick up stuff. The goal is just to get everyone on the same page. I'm not sure if that message was related to us. Okay, well, I apologize if we haven't given a good job with that. We didn't know until one day we had all these bags sitting out there with big bags on it. We didn't know nothing about this. I see. Okay. Yeah, so it's sort of a shock. It's not the way you want to learn something. Yeah, I understand. We picked it all up and threw it in the bin. Yeah, the purpose of those pink tags is really just to say what, what shouldn't be in, and if you just remove those few items that shouldn't be in, the rest is all good. Yeah. So. We're not checking off, okay, so we don't say what's not good. Yeah. It's light. Claude gave me a heads up this was the case. <laughs> yeah. How am I supposed to remove what's not good if I don't, you know, you don't Yeah, I'm, I have to apologize. I, I just chalked it up to human error. The driver probably <laughs> believed he had kicked something off and had it, and then stickers your bag with it. And I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Sorry, there's a question in the back that I kept um, missing. Yeah. Yes? Um, well, I have to say, I thought I was doing a very good job recycling, and I know this is a huge learning curve for all of us, so I, I will say I do commend you, GFL, for making these changes, even if they are hard, because three, two weeks in a row, my recycling too was left on the side of the road, when I thought I was doing a good job, but it was, it was rough, but it made me realize that I had become complacent. And I was buying products that I thought, you know, well, it's recyclable, so it doesn't matter. I'll put it in here and someone will take care of it. So that sucks for all of us, but I do appreciate that you guys are saying, whoa, we have to stop this right now. On that note, my question to you guys is then, if we are going to be so strict on this, then why are we taking all of the items that are recyclable and putting them into film plastic again, and or the other option, which I do see some people using, are the plastic blue bins, which I'm assuming are of <coughs> seven or five. What other alternatives can we use so that we can, those of us that will actually try and get on board, what can we do to help support this initiative? It's a very good point, and it's, it's one that I did expect. When you go with a blue box program, um, 
those blue boxes being out in the sun and all the rest of it and constantly being picked up and put down and, and kicked around, frankly, they actually break down quite a, quite rapidly. So you actually usually, they usually only last about 18 months. So they consume a certain amount of plastic because then the bin's broken. Um, the other problem with the blue boxes, it depends on the area, but this is true in many areas in Alberta, there's a lot of wind. And the material isn't protected and you get it blown. It also, when it rains, there's nothing to protect a lot of the materials and, and that can cause certain problems too. So blue boxes aren't a perfect solution. Uh, blue carts, uh, just like your waste cart, but instead of blue cart. Well, the problem is there's no way to see into the cart to see what's actually in there. So typically, like City of Calgary, they, they have by volume up to 30% contamination or by weight 17% contamination. If you visually see a pile of recycling with 17% by weight contamination, it, it pretty much looks like garbage with a lot of paper rather than recycling with some garbage. So it's very hard to enforce good practices and City of Calgary has learned that very painfully. So blue carts have some benefits. They're very sturdy and they stand up and they last, last a long time. They protect stuff from the elements. It's very efficient to pick them up with the automated trucks, but you can't monitor the contamination. Blue bags, protect it from the elements. If you need this much this week, you put on one bag. At Christmas, you put out 10 bags. It it's instantly can accommodate or however many bags you need. Um, protects it from the elements and you can see right into it. But now you've got a whole bunch of plastic film that's not recyclable at all. There is, n and this is a big industry debate of, of where this saws off at actually the best solution. For now, we've continued to use a blue bag program, so our plan for the immediate future is just to continue with blue bags because the blue cart would save us the bags, but then we'd have a bunch of problems with contamination and the blue box would cause other aspects of the program that residents probably weren't like very much as well with a lot of litter. So for now, we want to stay with blue bags. It's not perfect, but it's what we have at the moment. Um, again, in the future, if, if some of this recycling, like the plastic films, I alluded to EFS plastics, it, hopefully on the horizon there are some solutions. It's not a, not a perfect... <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure who's next. <coughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm pretty sure we're all very concerned about this. I, all I want to know, in reality, is, you know, I've got to educate my family because originally from the Philippines, they just throw everything in the ground. Right. Okay. Um, all I need is something I can step on the fridge and say, here's what we can put in the recycling. Unfortunately, the rest has to go to the country. Right. You got something like that? Oh, we do, actually, yes. Cool, because, you know, <laughs> as for the rest of it, I mean, like, the, the pick tags, yep, I got one. I'm pretty sure we all got one here. Oh, I didn't get one. <laughs> <laughs> there, was just, there was just a miscommunication of, of what was going to happen. Right. So, you know, all we need is a little education about what we can and can't do. Yeah. Okay, I'll work with Claude maybe on some fridge magnets or something. Or the, that would be wonderful. Certainly. Right. Oh, exactly. um, just so everyone is aware, there was a, that went on everyone's utility bill. This has a list of what is accepted and unaccepted. On the reverse is actually our 2019 waste collection schedule. So this tells you what days you're having pickup for waste, food bag, and organics. So it's double-sided. We have some of them out front here that you can grab on your way out. Uh, there's also on our website under waste management, this exact info, so if you're looking at it on the website, you can find it. There's also a waste wizard on there, so you can put in items specifically that you are, if you don't know if it's accepted or not, and it will tell you exactly which stream you're using. Is that what the phone app as well? That, there's also an app on that you can download on your mobile device. Is it updated? Yes, it is updated. Uh, there's also an option on there for you to be able to suggest items. So if there's something that we haven't put on there that you're repeatedly wondering where it goes, just suggest the item and when we go back in as an admin, we'll be able to add it to the list. So if everyone can do their due diligence too and help us out with that, we'll be able to support you in knowing where items go. Okay? So. Thanks very much. Sorry. And then, please go ahead. Paper, one was just tin, one was just plastic. And the tin wasn't 
stuff. So can you clarify, are you picking up tin? And, and what type of metal objects in that should not be in that bag? But can pie plates be in that or not? Can tin foil be in there or not? OK, so when you go to market a lot of those metals, um, you don't just market a material like I have some aluminum. You might market it as, you know, I have aluminum foil or pie plates, which would be considered an aluminum foil, or I have aluminum from computers, and it's a very different marketing. It's well known in the industry that as soon as you say aluminum foil, people know you mean from food. It typically has a lot of food residual on it, residue, and so it becomes very hard to market. That's why a lot of those aluminum foils aren't accepted in the program. That being said, though, if you... Well... Or you're assuming we're not washing our tins and our pie plates. Yes. You're... It, whenever... And it's been a, a factor in the industry that when people try to market this material, a lot of people will do it right, but then the ones that don't sort of spoil it for everyone, so to speak. It's, it's one of those things. Again, it's the reality is if... If I, as a recycler, sorted out a bunch of pie plates and made a bale of pie plates and went to the market and said, hey, I've got this great aluminum, well, oh, okay, great, you've got aluminum. From what? From pie plates? That's it. Click on the phone line. Because they've had so many issues where you pack in a sea can and it goes over the ocean, and by the time it gets to the other end, it's totally rank. Yeah. Just totally terrible. Like, they open it one whiff and shut the door and send it back. So, that's sort of the scenario. Now, if it's steel food cans or tin cans, um, those absolutely should have been picked up. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what happened in this case, and maybe it's an, an issue we need to advise the operator. Maybe he made an error. No cans labels on or off? Can labels can be on. Okay. Yeah. Oh. yeah. What about but no food residue. What about jars with metal in? They should be, so like a metal glass? Lid? Yes. A a metal oh, I see. Okay, so all, all those types of, of metals, okay, the, the, the real reality here is we get so little of that, it's just going to get mixed in with everything else, and it's going to end up going to the recycler to be recycled. But if I somehow only picked up those lids, again, the food residue might be an issue. So again, I don't always have perfect answers for you, but I am trying to give you the honest answers. So. Sorry, in the back, yeah? Uh, can you define clamshell? Yeah. <laughs> this is a clamshell. So. That's a no no? This is a no no. This is usually made out of like a number one plastic quite often. But this is the same grade as plastic film or plastic bags. It's totally different. This number one plastic, usually. But again, this is an industry of exception. So it is conceivable someone somewhere used this type of plastic to make this, or this type of master plastic to make that. So. How about colors in the plastic? All colors? Yeah, typically all colors, yes. Black? Do you know the yes, all every, color? all colors. Do you accept all colors? Yeah, as long as it's a rigid container, um, number one or number two, regardless of color, we'll accept it. What do you it. consider to be a rigid container? Right. So. Something like this is considered rigid. It's thicker, it's sturdy, you know. It's, you can't scrunch it up in your hand. And something like this would actually be considered flexible, a flexible plastic, because you can scrunch it in your hand. That's like a good rule of thumb. No, we don't accept these flexible ones either, but they're rarely one and two. They're usually like this one, five. But you can't find that you're relying on people to wash out. It's the same thing as jars and everything else. It doesn't get washed out. We are relying on people to wash everything. That's true. It's just the case that usually tin foils in particular have had this issue. So, um, so I go to Walmart and I buy a cake with a plastic. I mean, yes, no, yeah. When I came here tonight, I was expecting a table. For all the stuff that aren't supposed to go in the, in the blue box. That would be a very, very long table. <laughs> <laughs> everything that would would be a long table, and everything that wouldn't would be a, a, a long table. There's so many different plastic containers made, so many different variations. But we could try uh, to work with the town and produce something that is a little more exhaustive, has more examples. 
So we'll try to do that. Question here. Sorry. Sorry. You've done a great job. I just wish we would have done this before we started getting the pink letters and how many of those went into the dumpster and went into the landfill. There's a lot of good stuff in those, cardboard, etc. A lot of people would not have gone through their recycle to go take out three Sobeys bags and a lot of good stuff got thrown away. That's my one answer. Um, so Edmonton still takes these things. So you guys do not take your stuff to Edmonton. I always thought you guys did. No. Okay, so you do not. Okay. Safeway bags. If you uh, say to Sobeys, uh, Safeway have a little container where you can take the, the bags to go there. What do they do with those? Just curious. Do you know? Okay, so in that case, that is a uniform, all the same. They only take Safeway bags, and whatever type of plastic they use, it's only that. So they're in a very different situation than a program that will take 30 different types of bags. So they may be, may be in a much better position to actually get that material recycled. They're also a very large corporation and they probably have certain leverages to, to do the things that maybe others can't. Sorry. It's all good. Go um, I actually heard a really good question from over there and I'm going to steal it and I'm sorry. It was one of you two. I'm making eye contact with you guys. How do you find the number on the container? Okay, usually you flip it upside down and there's a recycling uh, loop and right inside the loop there should be a number stamped. But you need a magnifying glass for the light. <laughs> for the visually impaired. Sometimes, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Sorry, in the front. Um, Then put them in. So just go ahead. <laughs> yep. Oh, sorry. I'm then. just totally confused about the plastic bags business, just the grocery bags. Um, when it first came out, it had Sobeys on the form. I went to Sobeys, and now they're no longer taking them. I phoned the town here either today or yesterday, and they said, take them to Walmart. And I said, do they take all kinds of plastic bags? And they said, yes. So. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, you're right. It used to be at Sobeys, and then actually myself and uh, Donald Fairweather, if you, he's the operations manager for the town, uh, we've looked into bringing that extra service, I'll say, through Sobeys, because I've heard that Sobeys and other, other uh, um, stores like that would take the all plastic films. So we managed to do that. They had to go through a head office and get it all done. And just recently, I heard myself that um, that wasn't able, available at, uh, at Sobeys anymore. So Walmart does offer that. And my understanding is that they take all, all kinds of plastic films. So your bags from Safeway, Save-On, uh, Walmart. No frills. Can't go in no frills, exactly. So it doesn't help us here. I can try to look into maybe no frills, maybe they can do something like this, or go back to the school base and, and ask, you know, how come you discontinued that service, because it was handy. Um, but what is, you know, what does it go after that, I'm not certain. And um, so I can, I can try to do that. Uh, it'll take some time, but in the meantime, that's the only place that we know of that would accept these plastic films. Thank you. Thank you, Certainly, yep. No, uh, sorry, ma'am, I believe you're next, and then. Um, oh, yeah. Hard plastic chemical very thoroughly rinsed. That should probably be okay as long as the chemical wasn't hazardous. It's not stamped with like the poison or corrosive or something else. Yeah. You might see this not except because of caps. Are you talking about the caps on rigid balls that they're one there? Yeah, so. Yeah, this would be an example. Unfortunately, if you look at the cap, the cap would often a different grade plastic than the main container. Yeah, don't, we, technically, uh, we don't want the caps. Yeah. What number is this now? This is number one. This one's good. Ones and twos formed into a, into a, a rigid bottle like this. Good. <laughs> There's a question here for a while, Lorenzo. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I've been a resident of this town for about 35 years, 36 years thereabouts. I was 
I started my whole family recycling when we used to have the bins out there in the town shops. I thought at that time it worked very well. There was a metal bin, only metal went into it. Glass, only glass. And so on and so forth. This is very confusing. It's confusing to everybody here, one. Two, uh, I know in the beginning, it all went into one bag. Claude, I thank you for the recyclable cup. This goes into a waste bin, I understand. Uh, the solution here is the environment. It's not our environment now. We're, we're looking after it for that little girl over there. Are you talking to me? <laughs> no, her. <laughs> a little girl. <laughs> the issue is these one-use plastics, a lot of people use them for garbage bags. Solution, nickel a bag. How many here pick them up? How many bring your own bag to the grocery store? Yeah. Yeah. You're talking to the wrong people here. There's a lot of people out there that spend that nickel, like it's nothing. Make it a buck a bag or a five bucks a bag and they won't be doing it anymore. Or just do it for a Well, yeah, I do that or just ban it. And it's not just them, it's those clamshells. Look at the grocery store. That marketplace special that was on about a month ago in the UK, they banned it. The whole city just went all out for it and they just banned all plastics, people now have to bring their own means in order to pick up the groceries. And it took 10 weeks. Everybody was educated. But the reality is, what we're doing out there, it's all burning and it's ending up, like these plastics are in a net landfill. They're not gonna decompose. They, uh, they, they take almost as long as a pamper does in that landfill. So the solution isn't sorting it properly, the solution is banning it and getting on board. Well, I mean, all I can tell you is that I don't agree. So just from somebody involved with the town, is there any initiatives from the town that are looking at banning uh, plastic bags and single-use plastic? <clears throat> I, all I can say is that that would require a motion from council. That's not my call. No, understood. Right? Yep. So I just made a note actually to uh, to uh, bring that information back to council. And then, by the way, council wanted to be here tonight, and they cannot because they made it, their meeting with G Sacred, the, the Catholic School Board. Um, and so they've asked if we could record it so they could look at it later. And they didn't want to be here. So I'll make a point of bringing that back and other points that we're all collecting. And uh, we'll see where it goes. But uh, we, so, we hear you. I'll tell you what I told my son about it. My, my son's 13 and, and typical 13 year old, learning all about the environment like we all did when we were that age and we were all going to change it and it was going to be better when we hit this age. Mistake. Here we are. But he said to me, you know, Dad, how can it change? You know, what do we have to change? So we have to change the way we think. I said, if they take the toilet out of our house, what are you not going to do at home? Right? So if we can't recycle these plastics, you got to stop bringing them in. So we have to stop the manufacturers, we have to stop these little convenient clamshells and all the other plastics from showing up in our grocery stores and just buying them. You know, the other day I took him to a bulk food store with a bunch of glass jars just to show him. I don't plan on shopping that way my whole life, but I just wanted to show him. There's other ways that people think of it. Oh, absolutely. And if, if those that's, that's right. You get money back for those. Yeah. Yeah. But on on the on that point, um, all of you can reach for your your counselor of choice, and then bring the, bring those um, those requests or that that you know that thinking to them. And it would it would take a lot of changes. Um, and to go as far as banning, it can be done. Other municipalities have done it, and um, it's 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 at that level. So. Sobeys, No Frills, all the other stores that are in town would have to basically adjust to that as well. So it's more than just a quick decision, it's education and engagement and all the good stuff. So not impossible, absolutely not. Uh, it certainly is doable, um, but it's like anything else, it would be another change. So like this is a change, and, and I know it's been difficult for residents in town, and we've heard from St. Albert, and I think you can attest to that, there was a lot of um, pushback. Uh, and then some complaints from the residents. So we tried the best we could to educate 
and pass on information to residents so that so that we don't face that, and so that you can also participate in the pro in, in the changes to make to make uh, this program work better. But it it's going to take time, right? So it's good. I'm really glad that everybody came up tonight, and you have good. Feel free to con to connect with us. Feel free to connect with your councilor of choice or mayor for that for that matter, and um, the conversation will take place. And that's what you need to do. Thank you all very much, and also thank you for the town of Morinville. Uh, I also can attest that Morinville is really a very proactive administration, great to work with. So, thank you as well. So, if there's no more questions, if there are questions, stay behind. We can still continue. Um, if you heard enough, you can depart, if you will. Um, we're here for a little longer, so feel free to be here and then chat with us as, as, you, as, you, see, as you see a fit. There's also some samples on the table you can touch, feel, look at all you want. Thank you.